Check, check, check. Okay, there's that. All right, I think we are ready to go. Let's pray. So, gracious God, uh, we have uh, some moments here this morning to think about who you are and how you continue to, to reveal yourself to us. So, thank you for the students. Thank you for the parents uh, that are here this morning. So, Jesus, be present in this hour that we have together. Uh, we pray these things in your name. Amen. So, um, on your... Uh, Outline, um, the kind of theme today is going to be compassion. We're going to think about how God is a compassionate uh, God. We're going to be looking at the second um, uh, video in a couple of moments uh, from the Bible Project, episode two on uh, the whole, the verses of Exodus 34, six to seven, just a foundational uh, thing. I'm listening to a book right now, and I read the book. Um, it's by Michael Card. He's a singer, songwriter. Um, he's, he's old like me. Uh, he's, he's been singing songs for like 40 years, and he's, been, he's writing books. And there's a book called um, Inexpressible Hesed. The Old Testament word for this compassion, for this love, um, is, is called hesed. And that's the word that's used in this Exodus 34, 6. So let's say that word together, hesed, hesed. So again, the, the guttural of that from Hebrew is hesed. So uh, let me hear you say that. Thank you for all three of you that did that. That's awesome. So what we're going to do this morning is uh, what we looked at last time. If you'd open up your catechisms to page 63, page 63, and um, the, there's this great question, uh, question 37, what are some of God's attributes? God's attributes. And it gives us a whole uh, list, and it starts off with um, that God is good, uh, God is gracious, God is faithful. So, I um, prepared this sheet for you called um, I, an I am exercise. So, with, um, so, put your name on that sheet somewhere, and this will be a homework assignment. Uh, so, on the one side, uh, who God is, that he is the Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. And so, I want you to fill in those blanks with each of the words that are listed there from A to L. So, those, there's blanks there for you to list each of those words, and then put that same word in the column uh, that's labeled me. Uh, so one of the things that we want to realize that God is, uh, he can always say, I am good, I am gracious, I am faithful, I am hesed. Um, when what we have to say is, I am not always good. And um, we all know that's true, right? And if you don't know it's true as a student, your parents can share that you may not always be good. I'm not always gracious. I'm not always faithful. And then the list goes on. So I think this is a helpful exercise. Uh, again, when uh, we get this name for God, this I am, this capital I, capital A, capital M, when God is speaking to Moses um, in the wilderness with the burning bush, and Moses says, well, if I go down to Egypt to the people and say that God sent me, what is your name? And God gave this kind of, uh, just these, this, I am. And so again, the, the, the whole part of us following Jesus is, well, who is this I am? And what we need help with is to hear God say, I am good, I am kind, I am gracious, I am faithful. And for us to realize that I am not always those things. So I need God to be that great I am. And Jesus is the one that is the great I am in all those ways. So with that, let's watch this uh, video using the word compassion in this great, great Bible verse of Exodus 34, 6 to 7. So here's this week's segment. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting but when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way. 
compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. The very first word used in this description of God is compassionate, or in Hebrew, rachum. This word also appears as a noun, rachamim, or compassion. And what's fascinating is that both of these words are related to the Hebrew word for womb, rechem. So compassion in the Hebrew Bible is centered on a person's core, and the word invites us to imagine a mother's tender feelings for her vulnerable infant. So rahum is a word that conveys intense emotion. Sometimes it's even translated as deeply moved, like in the story of King Solomon who meets two women who've just given birth. One of their babies sadly dies, but then both women claim that the baby still living is theirs. As a test, Solomon says to cut the baby in two and give each mother a half. And the baby's real mother is deeply moved. She would rather the other woman take her baby than see her child die. And it's her compassion that reveals that she's the true mother. But rahum isn't just an emotional word. It also involves action. And surprisingly, the word is used most often to describe God's actions motivated by his emotions. Like when the Israelites are suffering and oppressed in Egypt, God hears their cries and is compelled by his compassion, his rachamim, to rescue them. Then, as the Israelites travel through the dangerous wilderness, they're hungry and thirsty. And God is Rahum, caring for them as his own child. He provides everything they need, food, water, and clothing, as he personally guides them. So it's no surprise that when Yahweh reveals his character to the Israelites in the wilderness, he begins by saying he's compassionate. But despite Yahweh's continual rachamim, the Israelites turn away from him time and again. They reject Yahweh's compassion and instead give their allegiance to other gods. And rather than showing compassion to each other, they do violence. And their rebellion results in exile and they're scattered among the nations. And it's in this dark moment in Israel's story that we come to the book of Isaiah where Yahweh compares himself to a mother full of rachamim toward her baby. He says, can a mother forget her nursing child or have no compassion or rachamim on the child of her womb? Even if she forgets, I will not forget you. God is full of motherly compassion and he will rescue his people. And as you read further in Isaiah, you realize that God is going to do this by entering into the suffering of humanity. And this points forward to a time when Jesus comes on the scene. He is Yahweh's deep compassion become human. In Greek, the word compassion is oiktirmas. And as Jesus embraces the sick and cares for the outcast, he is deeply moved by human suffering. Jesus compares himself to a mother hen using her wings to shield her chicks from danger as he gathers people into his embrace. And in the ultimate expression of oiktirmas, Jesus is moved by compassion to enter into humanity's suffering, into death itself, to rescue and bring us near to God. And it's this same life of compassion that Jesus calls his followers to imitate, allowing ourselves to be moved by the pain of others, to embrace the hurting, and to participate in relieving suffering in the world. In this way, we too can embody the compassion of Yahweh, or in Jesus' words, be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Now you can see how fitting it is that compassionate is the first word God uses to describe himself. So when we're in pain or see others suffering, we can be certain that God is deeply moved to respond and that he's there to meet us with his deep compassion. So uh, God is, he says, I am compassionate, and he's always compassionate. There's never a time that he's not compassionate. Even when bad, hard things are happening to us, or when we hear about a lot of bad, hard things happening in the world. Uh, we know that um, this church that God has given to us, unfortunately, it at times is not always compassionate either. 
but oftentimes, over and over, the church is compassionate. Uh, so um, part of my story is um, <clears throat> when I was born, uh, there would have been a scandal because I did not have a, a father. So um, when I was born, my grandparents were members of a very, very small uh, church in Addison, Iowa. I'm sure you've heard of it. And uh, that church had an option to, when uh, I called up to schedule my baptism uh, back in January of 1957, whether they would be a compassionate church or not. And I'm very, very thankful that they were a compassionate church, that on that day of my baptism with uh, my grandparents there and probably lots of other members that didn't think highly of the situation that the pastor still took me as an infant and put water on top of my head and said, uh, Jeffrey Scott Heliseth, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As you know, my last name is now Pruitt. That was my grandparents' name. Uh, I had a stepfather uh, 12 years later that uh, adopted me uh, and my two uh, younger brothers and uh, gave us all the name Pruitt. Um, so he was kind of showed some compassion too. So I'm very, very thankful for God's compassion and grace upon me and just remembering that and want to be a church that as often as possible to be compassionate and show them compassion. So I get to do a baptism today at 1130 um, of a two-year-old who was born during COVID. And the grandmother has been praying and praying and praying and praying for this little uh, boy to be brought into uh, uh, baptism, be brought to baptism. They were here this morning and got to bless them when they came up for communion. So again, as a church, we want to do as much as we can to be compassionate. But again, I know that I am not always compassionate. As much as possible, I want to follow God's character, and that's what we want to happen in your lives too, is to follow God's character of I am compassionate, I am compassionate, I am compassionate. So... Um, so the, the wonder of God is that he's compassionate to each one of us and he's compassionate to all kinds of other people. But again, when you go back to the original video of Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it also talks about uh, that God is slow to anger. We'll get into that uh, in a couple of weeks. So there's a compassionate side of God, but there's also this, uh, this side of God that um, there still has to be this thing called justice and righteousness. And so we'll get in, into that. Um, number two on your uh, sheet this morning is the, the story Bible, and part of what you were reading this uh, last time is there's God's story of Abraham. And here's just a, a kind of a principle that I live by and want to invite you to live by over and over again. There's always more to the story. As much as I know as much as you know about some of the stories. So again, as you're reading through the story Bible, you've all heard these stories before. You've heard about Abraham, you've heard about Moses, you've heard about King David, you've heard about Solomon, you've always heard these uh, before. But over and over, as you continue to grow older and older and older, following Jesus, following Jesus, reading these stories over and over and over again, there's just always more to the story. And so in my life as a pastor, obviously, I read and study these stories and think about these stories and meditate on these stories. And I've just come to always believe there's always more to the story. As much as I get excited about some new insight after all the years that I've read and read and read these stories, but then there's another angle. There's something that happens in the story and that, oh, that makes, uh, helps the story make uh, more sense. So there's always more to the story. So we know about Abraham, but there's so much more to know. And sometimes, not only is there so much more to know, but sometimes some of the things that we think about Abraham may not be fully correct. So how does God help us to realize there's always more to the story and more to the story, a big part of the more to the story is always God moving in the story. Um, again, um, uh, here's a challenge for you. Um, I love the story of Jonah and the whale. 
And oftentimes, as uh, children, you hear that story, Jonah and the whale, swallowed by a whale, three days later, kind of spit up onto the beach and does what he's supposed to do. Again, one of the things that's really, really uncomfortable uh, 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 to us at times, when actually you grow up and start looking at the story of Jonah from kind of a, a, a mature perspective as you are now young ladies and young men, it's a horrible story. Jonah is not a good prophet. But God writes a story through Jonah that Jesus connects to. In the New Testament, in one of the Gospels, Jesus says, well, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale or the belly of the big fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be. And he was. But there's more to the story of Jonah. And I'm reading a, a newer book by a pastor, Tim Keller, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, pastor, writer in that. And he just brings all this uh, interesting aspects of more to the story, more to the story, more to the story. But to get back to Abraham. So in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, got this printed out in your outline here. Uh, the Lord said to Abram, again, his name at first was Abram. Uh, God's going to change his name later. God does a lot of na name changes. Uh, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So as you read those verses, as you hear those verses, what word stands out as God is speaking to Abraham? Anybody want to give a Yes, what word is leaping out? It's repeated more than once, more than twice, more than three times. Robin, bless is the word. Ding, 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 ding. Bless. So that's the promise. And it's a promise through Abraham. Abraham. It's a promise to Abraham, but more than a promise to Abraham, it's a promise through Abraham. Now, what happens is that what you do here is that, of course, when we talk about this idea, bless me, I want God's blessings. But the big promise, the more to the story of God is not just blessing Abraham, the me here, he's blessing all people, or as we like to say it around here, all souls that matter. Here's the vision of God as he's doing this. This happens about 4,000 years ago to this person called Abram at the time. And out of all the people that existed at that time, God just says, Abram, I'm gonna choose you. I'm gonna bless you. And through you, the whole world's gonna be blessed. At the moment of that promise, God sees each one of us sitting here today. And all the others that are not sitting here this day. He sees in that moment what is going to be a blessing. What we see happening over and over again, the story of the Bible is that the Israelite people will say, will get to this idea, well, this blessing is all about me. It's all about my people. It's all about uh, the nation of Israel. That's uh, the, one of the big things, big takeaways from Jonah. Jonah wants um, all the people of Israel to be blessed. He doesn't want the people in Nineveh to be blessed by God. We deserve these blessings. God, you give us these blessings. God, we demand these blessings. Do not bless all these other people, especially when they are not your people. But the promise, the always more to the story is that through him. And so every time that the people of Israel make it about them, God rewrites the story and always moves through the story so that people like us could be sitting in here today and hearing about this amazing I am story. 
So all of us are blessed because of Abraham. Here, here's another little... Uh, um, so in this promise, um, uh, I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. How great is the name of Abraham? Do you realize that it's greater than any of the names that can come to your mind today? Even a name that's known by billions, whether it's a president, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a, the number one movie star in the world or the number one singer, songwriter in the world, as great as their names seem, there is no name greater than Abraham. Before you came in this morning, you heard about Abraham. I remember singing a song when I was a little kid 60 years ago. Father Abraham had many sons. And we, I go over to Thailand, to Laos and Vietnam. And the Hmong people open up the Bible in the Hmong language. And we read about Father Abraham. I've spent uh, hours teaching them through Genesis um, and the story of Abraham. The name Abraham is known by every Christian in the world, no matter what time they have lived in this world. So it's true. And then the rest of the promise is, oh, bless those who bless you and whoever curse you, I'll curse you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So we are blessed through Abraham. He was not always a good person, but the God that he was following has always been. And then, um, as we know, uh, the story of Abraham is this, so here's this amazing promise, and a part of it was that through your wife, Sarai, uh, before he changes the, the, her name to Sarah, you're going to have a child, and that child will have children, and those children will have children, and those children will have children, and those children will have children. And we know that um, a year goes by, two years go by, four years go by. And Abraham goes, what's going on, God? I'm getting older, not getting any younger. And so there's a, another part of the story is that in Genesis 15, what's on your outline here, God took him outside, God took Abram outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. We sang about that and sometimes by step, the last song that we sang in church today. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Before he had one, God said, look up at the stars. And again, I have to remember always, there's no city lights back then. It's just a... Uh, Millions and millions of stars on a black background. You just can't even count them all. Again, as we know from the newest telescope that's out there, the number of stars have multiplied into the trillions and millions of galaxies. Of course, Abraham couldn't see all those. But what he saw, what he saw, were numbered in those stars. So again, put these questions here. What do you see? What do you think? What does God want you to see? What does God want you to think? So as we consider the story over and over and over again, who is this person, Abraham? And why is his name so great? Well, his name's so great because of the God who moved through his name. We're not to focus about Abraham, the me in this story, we're to focus on the God that wants to work through him so that all souls can know who this God is. So um, again, from uh, the Bible project, Genesis 12 to 50. So again, the story of Abraham starts in Genesis 12 and then the rest of the, um, uh, the book of Genesis goes through those early uh, decades and a couple of centuries into the story of the Israelites. So let's watch this next um, uh, Bible uh, video, the Genesis 12 to 50, the Bible book overview video. The book of Genesis 
In the first video, we saw how chapters 1 through 11 set up the basic storyline of the Bible. God has created all things and he makes humans in his image to rule the world on his behalf. The humans choose sin and rebellion and so the world spins out of control into violence and death, all leading up to the rebellion and scattering of the people in Babylon. And so the big question is, what is God going to do to rescue and redeem his world? Well, out of that scattering at Babylon, the author traces a genealogy of just one family that leads eventually to a man named Abram, later known as Abraham. And God's promise to Abraham at the beginning of chapter 12 opens up a whole new movement in the story. God calls Abraham to leave his home and go to the land of Canaan, which God says will become his one day. And in that land, God promises to make Abraham into a great nation, to make his name great and to bless him. Now, these promises are connected back to earlier parts of the book. So Babylon had arrogantly tried to make a great name for itself, and that didn't go over very well. But God, in his generosity, is going to bestow a great name on this no-name guy, Abraham. And God's blessing of Abraham echoes all the way back to that original blessing God gave humanity in the beginning. So the question is why is God going to bless Abraham and his family? And the last line of God's promise makes this clear. So that all the families of the earth will find God's blessing in you. Now this is key for understanding the whole rest of the biblical story. God's plan is to rescue and bless his rebellious world through Abraham's family. And this is why the whole rest of the Old Testament story is just going to focus on this one family, eventually called the people of Israel. This is also why Israel will later be called a kingdom of priests at Mount Sinai. God wants to use them to show all of the other nations what he's like. And ultimately, this is the promise that gets picked up by the later biblical prophets and poets who say that its fulfillment will come through Israel's messianic king, whose reign will bring justice and peace to all of the nations. Now at this point of the story, none of that's clear. You just have to keep reading and watch the promise develop. And so the rest of the book focuses on Abraham and his family. First Abraham himself, then his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob, and then Jacob's 12 sons. And the stories about each generation, they're united by two main themes. So first, each generation of Abraham's family is marked by repeated failure. They just keep making really bad decisions that mess up their lives and that put God's promise in jeopardy. However, God remains faithful to them. He keeps rescuing them from themselves and reaffirming his commitment to bless them and bless the nations through them despite their failings. So the Abraham stories. God had promised Abraham a huge family, but on two different occasions, he's afraid for his life because other men are attracted to his wife. And so he denies that he's even married to her, which creates, of course, all of these problems. And not only that, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they can't have children. And so Sarah arranges for Abraham to sleep with one of their servant girls, which also creates all of these problems in the family. But each time, God bails Abraham out. And in chapters 15 and 17, God even formalizes his promise to Abraham with an official commitment called a covenant. This is a classic scene. God invites Abraham to look up at the night stars and to count them. And he says, that's how numerous your family is going to be. And despite all of the odds, having no kids and no way to have any at the moment, Abraham looks up in the sky and simply trusts God's promise. And God responds by entering into a covenant with Abraham, promising that he will become a father of many nations, that God's blessing may come to the whole world. God asks Abraham to mark his family with a sign of the covenant, circumcision of all the male boys in the family. This is a symbol to remind them that the fruitfulness of their family is a gift from God. And so Abraham has lots of kids eventually, and he dies at a good old age. Now the Jacob stories play out these themes even more dramatically. From birth, Jacob lives up to the meaning of his name, which is deceiver. He cheats his brother Esau out of his inheritance and blessing, and he does it by deceiving his old blind father, no less, and then he just takes off. He goes on to take four wives, even though he really only loves one, Rachel, and this creates all of these rivalries in the family. The only thing that humbles Jacob is being deceived by his uncle Laban, who cheats him out of years of his life. The tables have finally turned.
And so it's a humbled Jacob that returns to his homeland. And in a very strange story, Jacob ends up wrestling with God as he demands that God bless him. Some things never really change, do they? However, God honors his determination and he passes Abraham's blessing on to him. And he renames Jacob as Israel, which means wrestles with God. Now, it's this last part of the book, the story of Jacob's sons, where all the themes come to a head. Jacob loves his second to youngest son, Joseph, more than any of the others. And he gives him this special jacket. And the ten older sons come to hate Joseph. And so they kidnap him and they plan to kill him. But instead, they decide to just sell him into slavery in Egypt, where he ends up in prison. Talk about family failure. But God is with Joseph, and he orchestrates Joseph's release from prison, and Pharaoh ends up elevating Joseph to second in command over all of Egypt. And so Joseph saves the nation of Egypt during a famine, and he also ends up saving his brothers and his family from starving to death. And so once again, we can see the folly and the sin of Abraham's family is met with God's faithfulness, who subverts even the evil of the brothers into an occasion to save life. And this is actually what Joseph says right near the end of the book. He says to his brothers, you all planned this for evil, but God planned it for good to save many lives. Now, these words are strategically placed at the end of the book because they summarize not only the story of Joseph and his brothers, but the book as a whole. From Genesis 3 onward, humans keep acting selfishly and doing evil, but this God is not going to leave his world to its own devices. He remains faithful and determined to bless people despite their failures. You can see this especially in how that mysterious promise about the descendant of the woman gets developed throughout the book. So remember, Genesis 3, God promised that this wounded victor would come and crush the snake and defeat evil at its source. And the author then connects this promise directly to the line of Abraham. This is a part of how God's going to bring his blessing to the nations. Now, from Abraham, this promise gets connected to Judah, the fourth son of Jacob. And this is how. In an extremely important poem in chapter 49, in aging Jacob, he's on his deathbed. He wants to bless his 12 sons. And when he comes to Judah, Jacob predicts that Judah will become the tribe of Israel's royal leaders and that one day a king will come who will command the obedience of all the nations and fulfill God's promise to restore the garden blessing to all of the world. World. And then after this, Jacob dies. And later, Joseph dies too. And the growing family remains in Egypt. And so the book of Genesis ends with all of these future hopes and promises left hanging and undeveloped. And it forces you to turn the page to see how it's all going to turn out. But for now, that's the book of Genesis. So again, what we get to see there, just kind of that, again, that's a big old broad sweep, what we call an overview of the whole book of Genesis. They actually broke it into two parts. There's a Genesis 1 to 11 that's uh, available online, and this was uh, 12 to, to 50. Um, going back to another video that we've watched a number of times, and we'll continue to watch it. I think it's just one of the great teaching uh, videos um, uh, ever. This aspect of um, uh, the patterns of the, of the Bible. And if you remember, the whole aspect of it was that what God creates is good. I mean, God wants to bless. God wants to bless over and over again. So in Genesis uh, 1 and 2, um, uh, there's that, the word good, or in the Hebrew, it's tov. Uh, uh, say the word uh, tov. Tov um, is the word for good. So all the things that are good, 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 good. Um, Adam and Eve uh, look and take. And um, uh, from that tree of good and evil, and then we know that things are broken. So um, in the story th there, um, God wants to bless Abraham and Sarah. From you are going to come a nation that will bless all the people, all the souls that matter. Um, so it wasn't happening, wasn't happening. They want to help God. And so uh, they looked at Hagar. Hey, she's young. She looks like she probably is fertile. Um, and so they take her, and she has a son, but it's just going to lead to more brokenness. 
But what we see happening that every time uh, that God wants, here's for good, they take and it, it's broken, God will still come back and bless. Again, there's going to be uh, consequences from things being broken, but it's going to come back and bless over and over again. So we know that uh, uh, Ishmael, the son of Hagar and Abram, is not the chosen child. It's not, his soul matters, but God is writing a different story and God gets to write the story as he, because he is God. Um, and so uh, they will have a son. Um, it mentioned this thing called circumcision and again, we won't take much time with that, but uh, God implements circumcision when Abram, Abraham at that point is now 99 years old. And a year later, Isaac is born. So there are just all these kind of things that, okay, the only way that Abraham and Sarah were able to have a child when he's 100 and she's 90 is if God blesses and writes a story that we cannot write or even fathom. So there's always more to this story. So again, it wasn't because God blessed them because of this thing called circumcision. God said, here's circumcision. Now I'm gonna bless you in the, in the promise that I made 25 years ago. God's timing is not our timing, but God is always wanting to end with blessing. Over and over, the story of God ends with blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing, even though we as people are we're, God gives us lots of good gifts, we take them, and then we wonder why our lives end up being broken over and over again. And so God will bless us, but sometimes we have to surrender and, make, and ask God to forgive us, to give us the blessing he wants to give us instead of the blessing that we wanna take, and it isn't good for us. So um, with that, let's uh, open up our uh, catechisms to page uh, 58. And just going to do a very big sweeping uh, overview of the Ten Commandments. And again, uh, leave it to you to read through um, the questions and the Bible passages that are in your uh, catechism. So um, you should have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So we just got past uh, Halloween, um, and so oftentimes Halloween is all this thing about fear. There's all this um, uh, skeletons and ghosts and all this crazy uh, stuff in that. Uh, and oftentimes when we think about fear, that's the kind of fear that we think about. And that's not the fear that the Bible is talking about. The fear of the Bible is that there's some powers out there. There's some things that could really harm us and do damage to us. Fear those, or the other word that I would uh, substitute for it is respect. So for um, the, uh, uh, the uh, gentlemen that are here, um, you're taught to fear uh, power tools. Power tools are great. I was using a, a power uh, electric screwdriver yesterday. I love using a power uh, uh, screwdriver. Makes the work go so much faster and so much better than that. Um, but uh, uh, you have to respect it because one of the things about power tools, there is no forgiveness. If you um, take a power tool and you, you just, you're broken. I mean, you can, if you're playing with, a, or not playing or using a, a saw, uh, you can lose a finger and there's people, you always, um, always loved in uh, middle school, our shop teacher um, would always say, I want you gentlemen to be very, very careful with the tools that you're gonna use because See, I wasn't careful one time and I only have three fingers because I cut off one. Like, that is a good lesson from a shop teacher. And I remember being very careful with uh, tools and that. Um, uh, and then just something like a, a knife. A knife is a wonderful thing. You can do all kinds of things with, with a, a knife. From creating art to cutting stuff up that you need to be, needs to be cut up. But we also know that a knife can be dangerous. God is more powerful than any power tool or any knife. And so we need to fear him with this very, very high respect. So that's what, the, uh, what we're getting at with this. So we should fear, love, and trust, trust, trust 
in God uh, above all things. So, um, so there's the, the questions that uh, come after that. And then obviously it is with uh, the, commandment, the first commandment that um, we get to question 37 that again you've got homework on. What are some of God's attributes? Why should we fear and love and trust God above all things? Um, those attributes give us uh, a reason uh, for that. And there's other um, uh, questions there. Uh, second commandment on page uh, 67. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Uh, what does this mean? So again, all the responses will always be, we should fear loving uh, God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. It's uh, always a fascinating thing um, that the name of God is the only religious name that is often abused and the, the second commandment is broken. So we hear people at times say, Jesus Christ. And they're not really talking about Jesus or Christ. Or God blanket. You try to do that with Muhammad, around people that follow Muhammad, uh, you will probably feel some physical pain really quick. Or Buddha. You don't ever hear anybody say, oh, Buddha. But it's always God and Jesus Christ. But when we get to the Lord's Prayer and um, hallowed be thy name, God's name is always holy, even when people misuse his name. You can't put a dent into God's name. But people that misuse the name of God, they're putting a dent into themselves. But even that, God wants to bless and bring that dent back out to honor the name of God and honor the name of Jesus Christ. Page 74, the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Uh, this is a commandment that is just broken. But yet, in all of its brokenness, God continues to provide his church for people to hear the word of God and to gather under this word, and he will bless them. One of the books I just read, uh, a couple of authors that basically say, we hear people all the time say, I can be a Christian without being in God's church. That is an untrue American statement. It's not what the Bible teaches. We know that church can definitely be broken. But over and over, if you're going to receive God's blessings as God designed it, it comes through his church. And over and over again, the church is all kinds of things, but it's still with us. We're not in the toughest times that God's church has ever faced. We're just in a time that it's a lot of people think, a lot of Americans, a lot of people all around the world. As long as I got food and water and shelter and a job and I'm a good person, this whole idea of being good, I don't need the church. Uh, God's church, I love God's church. So even as I move into not literally retirement years, but I'm going to be involved in God's church every Sunday. I'm going to be involved in God's church Monday through Saturday. I'm going to be involved in God's church uh, in all kinds of ways. I'm looking forward to it. So again, the invitation is remember the Sabbath day to keep it, keeping it holy. So, and then the next commandment, uh, the parents love this one, honor your father and your mother. Page 81, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love, lo love them, and love and cherish them. So again, there's a lot of uh, um, wisdom and teaching in that, and uh, it's also the, uh, the 
uh, the commandment that has a promise that if you do this honor your father and your mother, um, it will go well with you and you'll have a long life. Again, um, I don't have an earthly father to honor, uh, but I thank God that somehow um, he provided uh, uh, the, for my mother to have me. And uh, I've tried to honor my mother. Haven't done it uh, perfectly by any st uh, stretch. Uh, but again, just this aspect of honor, mother and father. And there's a lot of things uh, with that. Uh, the fifth commandment on page 85, thou sh you shall not uh, murder. Uh, we should fear and love so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. Uh, a lot goes into that uh, commandment. And we know that, uh, again, um, uh, uh, that's a commandment that is um, challenged in all kinds of ways. Uh, obviously, our our culture has been um, inundated with the whole abortion thing, but that's been going on for 40 some years. Now that there has been uh, a Supreme Court ruling and all the politics that are going on, that's you know coming up uh, this uh, Tuesday. Uh, but the commandment of God is still strong, and people that choose to take, they're just going to be broken, but God can still bless. There's some amazing stories out there of people that take and are broken, and God turns them around, and they confess, and God blesses them, especially through the wonders of who our Jesus is. On page 93, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do. And husband and wife love and honor each other. And lots of uh, questions about what is marriage, um, uh, what is adultery. Uh, does this commandment apply only to husbands and wives? How do we fear and love God and keep in the sixth commandment? And lots of other uh, questions here. Uh, but it's a... a Something that, uh, again, the whole aspect of adultery is you're going to take, and it looks really good, but when you take it, brokenness happens, and we live in families. Uh, that's one of the um, things that can help us as followers of, of God. When you read through the book of Genesis, and you see dysfunction after dysfunction after dysfun dysfunction in the people that God wants to bless and the people that God has made promises to, and they keep taking and breaking, uh, that, uh, that those families, somehow God still writes the story through, he can write his story through uh, some of our uh, brokenness and uh, um, dysfunction that is in all of our uh, families. Uh, the seventh commandment, you shall not steal, um, page 105. Uh, we should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in dishonest way, but help him to improve, improve and protect his possessions and income. Here's a principle on all the Ten Commandments that I'll uh, use with this one. So um, uh, we break the commandments when we don't do something we are supposed to do and not only when we do something we're not supposed to do. I don't know if you caught that. You can break the commandments in two ways. You can steal, which is breaking a commandment, correct? But you can also break that commandment by not helping someone to keep what is rightfully theirs. So the illustration I always use is that you are in your classroom, and there's a number of students, you know, young men, young ladies and that, and uh, you notice a classmate stealing a pencil from someone else's possessions. But you don't want to be a snitch, you don't want to be a tattletale, and so you don't help the person keep what is rightfully theirs. You've just broken the commandment, even though you didn't steal. And so that's a principle, again, that just goes all over. So, again, we're, uh, we, we are commandment breakers, even when we don't think we're breaking command. None of us in this room are probably ever going to murder someone going back to that commandment. But Jesus says when we have hate for someone else, there's a murder involved in that. So, uh, again, this uh, is a commandment that, um, uh, that gets broken by us probably more than we know. All right, um, a, few, a few more there. Uh, quite Page 110, 
Eighth commandment, you should not give false testimony against your neighbor. Uh, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. So again, how do you break that commandment? So we're together with uh, three friends, and we're having a conversation, and they start talking about someone all three know, but in ways that they're talking is not a good way. But that friend's not there. And so do we say, hey, let's not talk about her, let's not talk about him in that way. There might be more to the story than what we know. But if we don't say anything, uh, we've just broken that commandment. And it's hard not to. Um, so, uh, two more here. We'll be back. Um, page 115, they put these two together on the same page. You should not covet your neighbor's house. We should fear love uh, God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or to get it in a way which only appears right, uh, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. And then you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his um, manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or his um, uh, Lexus or his Mercedes um, or his, uh, those kind of things. Again, most of us don't have um, oxes and donkeys anymore. Anything that belongs to your neighbor. We should fear love God so that we do not entice or force away from our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. So again, all the commandments come back down to this thing. God created all things, and they are good, they're good, they're good, but when we take, we take, we take, there's going to be broken, 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 and so God knows that we're going to break these commandments, but he comes back and blesses and blesses and blesses. So, um, uh, I, on the back of your I am exercise, uh, there is a thank you God exercise. So again, uh, thank you God for and gave you 10 lines to just um, thank God and express that he is a God that gives us the 10 commandments. He's a God that forgives us when we break the 10 commandments. He's a God that helps us to get, hopefully get wiser as we're following him instead of getting foolish uh, as we're following him. And then um, one more uh, video, uh, the Bible project, the law biblical theme video. So again, it's gonna teach us about this idea of, of uh, following God. So let's watch this and then we'll almost be wrapping up. You're most likely familiar with the 10 commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first 10. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws, they're about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just the complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. Yeah, don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. 
And so Moses gives some more laws, and then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just going to continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new, transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land, they break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others. And he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. This video was made possible by over 1,300 people who chipped in, and most of those are monthly givers to the Bible Project. Thank you guys so much. We make a lot of videos like this one that trace a biblical theme from the beginning to the end of Scripture. We're also making videos about every book of the Bible, helping you learn about its design and overall message. We're committed to keeping these videos free, And we're able to do that because of your support. If you want to see more videos or other resources we have, go to jointhebibleproject.com. Oh, that was awesome. So uh, that's uh, Tim Mackey and John Collins. Uh, Tim Mackey was a graduate student at University of uh, Madison a number of years ago in the Hebrew department. Um, One of the wonderful things that most people don't know, the University of Madison actually has one of the world's top Hebrew departments. So Tim Mackey came and studied there. He is a self-identified Bible geek. That's probably um, something that they produced five, six years ago, and they've produced all kinds of videos uh, since then. The ones that we've been watching at the, t- at the top are newer ones. But anyway, and they're um, uh, 
Contributors now uh, go up to about 40,000 people from around the world. Uh, they end their projects and, or their podcasts with oftentimes having someone uh, from uh, other places of the world uh, thank them for the Bible Project videos. Anyway, a uh, quick commercial uh, there for them. So, um, but here's what we're getting at. Uh, reason we're going to keep watching these kind of videos. I think they do such a wonderful job of summarizing some things that are very, very complicated in that. But um, what you saw there over and over again, what we're going to get back to, it just, it's broken. Um, it's, they're just, uh, it, there's no doubt about it. The Bible uh, tell, tells us about things that are broken, 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 even though God continues to write a story through broken people. They are never good people. They're broken people. What makes them good is that when they realize that I know I'm broken, but I'm following Jesus. And Jesus allows us to follow him when we are broken. And he promises to bless us as we follow him in a humble way. And we're trying to do it together. We're trying to do it long. Even though there's going to be forces that are going to try to pull us apart. There's going to be forces that want to uh, try to uh, uh, make us go away and not do that. But the, it's all to glory. That's the message of the Bible. Uh, it starts in the paradise of Eden, and it ends in the paradise of a recreated Eden that we can't even hardly imagine. But every passing day that we live, no matter who we are and what our age is, we're one day closer to glory, or we're one day closer to a place that we don't want to end up in. So that's the story. We are broken, but we're following Jesus together, long to glory. So your assignment uh, along with the, um, the, the uh, I am exercise and thank you God exercise and your story, Bible uh, worksheets and that. Also, um, just read uh, uh, four pages to introduce the Apostles' Creed, which we'll get into our next class in a couple of weeks. Um, and then uh, uh, read pages, uh, another 30 pages of just the first article, parts one, two, and three uh, in your catechism. So let's close with a word of prayer. So gracious God, these young men, these young ladies that are learning about you and, and uh, will continue to learn about you throughout the course of their life, we pray that as you continue to help them with this confirmation experience, reading through the story Bible, getting themselves a little more familiar with the teaching that's in uh, the small catechism. Help us, Jesus, as we uh, keep following you. We know that we live in a very, very broken world, and we are broken people. But some wonder, there's just a wonder that you continue to love us and cherish, uh, cherish us, and we have souls that matter. So help us to follow you, Jesus. You, Jesus. Step by step, following you, Jesus, for, for you show us the wonder of who our Father is, that he is the great I am. And you're part of that amazing trinity along with the Spirit of God. So again, Spirit of God, help each one of us so that our hearts don't get hardened, that you sow into us a softness and a love and a warmth to our hearts to always follow you, Jesus, no matter what. We ask and pray these things in your name. Amen. So again, uh, see you in a couple of weeks. And again, uh, very exciting news for those that um, weren't able to be here in worship. Uh, the second pastor is coming. Uh, he's accepted our call. And so that's a very, very exciting news. And he'll be uh, helping uh, teach some of the confirmation as we get into 2023. So uh, he's going to bring a freshness that I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to him being here with us and his family. He's got uh, 10 children uh, and six of them. Uh, our lovely, lovely children that they have brought in from the world in adoption. So looking forward to uh, uh, walking alongside it. And there will probably be uh, one or two of those children that will join us in our confirmation process. All right, with that, thanks. <laughs>